All right, so welcome to the first of the two panel sessions this afternoon. The first one, um, we're addressing the subject of the moment, I suppose, telemedicine and, um, and with that remote monitoring. So I know there's a lot of docs and Brian's very involved in that as well, where remote monitoring, it was becoming a, a, a big thing um, before COVID even hit but now it's kind of even more uh, appropriate. Um, but then just like uh, telemedicine itself was also evolving, right? And it's kind of been forced to, to speed up now that, um, now that COVID has hit. So, um, I, I, you know, and I mean, Dorian is the is this founder and CEO of, of uh, Keto Mojo. And so his interest, and, and then, but he's going so much further than just the meeting now, the, all the integration with and collecting of other data and stuff. Um, maybe we can start there, Darian. It's just um, explain your vision, because I know, I know you've got this whole thing in your head about where we could, where we could be with this. Um, so maybe give us a frame, a frame there, and then um, hopefully, uh, Dr. Westman will drop in Westman, at some point. Um, so if you go back 10 years, you know, that first Operation Lindbergh uh, was uh, amazing across the entire Atlantic. But if we fast forward 10 years, how are we doing? And this is the, the challenge um, to everybody um, because we've suddenly been hit very quickly with COVID and the need for telemedicine and the, the actual healthcare system in America is not ready for it. Uh, we have a patchwork quilt of uh, different uh, um, systems. You have United Healthcare, you have different private payers systems that is out there, you have VA systems, and none of them can talk with each other. None of this is a standardization of the data. And you have to look at telemedicine in different realms of there is the there's gonna be the hospital grade where a surgeon can operate from his office using fly-by-wire. They're already doing it in, in operations. And then you'll have um, portable operation um, areas or an area set up in remote cottage hospitals that they can, a, uh, a surgeon can do one operation, then go straight to the second one without any kind of like scrubbing or anything like that. And back to back to back, create do operations. And the, um, uh, the, the beauty of that is that surgeon can do more, quicker, faster, iterative, and be better at it. So that's kind of what if we look on, on like a big hospital grade level. But then as we come down into the primary care physician world where Brian works, you know, quite often primary care physicians, you find they're used to getting data and reviewing it from like last six weeks or last eight weeks or even longer. And they look down at that data and they make decisions by it. So it's a snapshot of a person as they see that. Then we're going to look into the other side is the data streams that will come into play. This is really important. You know, now we can have real-time heartbeats. Now we can have real-time continuous glucose monitors. Now we can have real-time sleep. Now, how does a system that, that is designed to see snapshots deal with data feeds? Most of the systems that the doctor uses is, is done about how to do the accounting, how to do the coding, how to do the, the scheduling of the, of the individuals, and how to hold some data that is in there. That's what they were built at. That's sort of like QuickBooks for doctors. But then how does that then come on to a doctor actually being able to perform better? How are they going to have augmented um, uh, triage, if you will, or intelligence? How does a doctor in real time say, who are my most at-risk patients? Who um, should I be focusing on today? Because in our world, we're changing people's habits. Because, yeah, you can say that's the problem. But how do you get down to the root cause and change the person's habit to reduce it? And those things need to happen in, in real time. And that's where I think that data-driven and telemedicine will come on in. And so to answer your question as to how we see um, uh, our, our company um, uh, progressing, and we see a lot of companies that is, is doing this, 
is the ability to open up that data in, in a secure HIPAA compliant encrypted health cloud API and then one by one connect into all of those different healthcare systems. And this is really, really difficult to do that because I've got to go to each healthcare platform uh, and that each doctor prefers to use on each medical system and to be able to interconnect and get their attention to do that. That's why we need a much better standard uh, across America and across the globe so that you can have the interoperability um, uh, through that. You know, it shouldn't be, you know, a, a patient should be able to be able to have all of their information track with them at any one time. I am fed up with filling out another intake form. How many times have we filled out the stupidity of the intake form and have wasted half an hour in our lives? And what has changed since the last one? For very most people, 99% of the time, nothing. This is where we have to improve on telemedicine. And it's through a system-wide approach. And it's also through um, a wearables approach. And it's also giving people like Brian and Dr. Westman um, the tools in which they need um, uh, to be able to be better with their patients. And I think they can speak to that better than I could. From, from what I've heard, one of the, I, we don't, I don't know how involved you are um, with telemedicine and remote monitoring and all of that stuff. So um, maybe we've even got a different perspective from you. Yeah, can you hear me okay? We can, yes. Yeah, so I'm within a university practice. We use a large um, computer that a lot of universities use for our, our um, monitoring and communication and charting. Uh, and we have, over this last year, gone for a while almost 100% telemedicine. And um, I can speak to you now we're back in the clinics and I can speak to you as an obesity medicine doctor or lifestyle doctor treating diabetes. Um, I've learned that there are boundaries of safe use of what we're doing, that sometimes going all telemedicine is going to, going to hit. So uh, coming from a practice where everyone had to come back and there was no questioning of what well, you just have to come back every month or whatever the interval was, now there's this, well, can I do it by phone? Uh, I'm late, I can't go across town. I, I see these appointments being changed from face-to-face -to, -face to tele, either phone or, or telemedicine at the last minute. Now, it might be fine. It could have been that the person was gonna drop the appointment anyway, but it, it introduces a, a level of safe use that needs to be part of the conversation. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm learning though, for those who don't need the medical deep prescribing. Uh, remember, I just use a, a diet related program. I'm not using medications and I'm going, I'm going to include now a telemedicine part of my practice that I never had before. Uh, of course, finances permitting because it's allowed me to treat people from a long distance uh, I, I see people who travel a distance um, uh, pretty much all within North Carolina, and that's another issue about telemedicine that's crossing state lines. But I think it'll be interesting to see if the payment continues uh, from Medicare and Medicaid, of course, and insurance, but also there's the fee for service. A lot of the obesity medicine doctors just do cash on cash pay, so they really don't have to be concerned with whether insurance pays for it or not. Um, so anyway, that I, I maybe we could talk, talk a little bit, Brian, I think I saw you nod your head a little bit about the safe use of what we're doing. You know, I always kind of think like I'm selling someone a bike and, and I assume they know how to ride a bike. I don't really make sure they have a bicycle riding permit, you know, and uh, so what we do does have some inherent risk if somebody doesn't know what they're doing. Uh, but um, so maybe can we um, talk about just the sort of risk management of a practice, telemedicine and in-person and experience about that? Yeah, we can, but I think, Brian, we still don't have audio from you. 
I have a few questions. Um, yeah. If you want it to be specifically on telemedicine, um, or um, well, with uh, I have a question for Dorian as well. Um, okay. I'll be happy I to Okay. So, Dorian, what is your background? Reading your bio. And I use Keto Mojo a lot in my practice. I mean, again, I've just been doing this for about two years now, um, 25 years family doc, but um, doing more with uh, my patients um, because of the giants like Dr. Westman and Dr. Lenskis. And, um, and I really love using the Keto Mojo. But my question is, what is your background that you felt you could, you know, you, you found this low carb diet and then you could jump into this market and actually make a dent with the, prices and with a meter and the strips. I just thought that was very interesting. And then how do you force ES incorporating that um, from well, a yeah, an IT uh, standpoint? That's, that's, a, that's a great question. I think that a background of a little crazy sort of helps here. Uh, I, I look at, uh, at this esteemed group and every single one of you have got letters after your name after spending a huge amount of time <laughs> at, at school. And, uh, and university, and I went to the University of Hard Knocks a little bit um, here. Uh, so my background was how um, the ketogenic diet, and, and certainly to you, Dr. Westman, I mean, all your YouTube videos that you had in your fa fabulous page four uh, were, were sort of like big influences on me. And, you know, I had been ballooned up. I had got 207 pounds. Um, I had lost my joie de vie. And, you know, nothing was working for me. And then a friend of mine said, you know, you've got to give up those white devils. It's the white devils that are doing it to you. And, you know, I've seen Jeremiah, my wife, do lots of fad diets, uh, cabbage soup diet, you know, all of these things. And uh, I, I don't recommend the cabbage soup diet for, for several reasons, which, first of all, the cooking smells is awful in the kitchen. And, uh, and you know, I, I went keto. Uh, I had started paleo, then I went keto, you know, it's so funny, like paleo, and I'm eating fruit leathers like you've got nobody's business, but it's paleo, uh, great marketing term. And, you know, as I went keto, that's when everything changed for me. And I started watching my, my weight drop off. And, you know, um, you know, the 20 gram carb rule, for me, that was just a little bit too um, restrictive in my mind. And so I purchased an Abbott meter. Uh, and purchased their strips and back then they were like four or five dollars for a ketone strip and i was testing and adjusting to my carb edge like i live in the napa valley i come from a wine background I, uh, my wife's a certified sennelier i had been in the wine industry for many years and um you know i wanted to enjoy great foods and i was like well, where is my edge that i need for me maintaining um my level and lo and behold, I lost 47 pounds. It was amazing. And, but as people say, when your brain is being fueled on ketones, you know, you, you get that mental clarity. And that mental clarity for me was the fact that it was like, well, why does this little plastic strip cost four bucks? When you take it apart, mm -hmm. it doesn't make any sense at all. No, no sense in an economical format. So uh, then I drew up a list of 100 different manufacturers across the globe cross match that to the federal regulations and dialed and you know basically we cut out the middle we cut out the marketing bs that you get with it that causes a huge amount of bloat and we were able to launch into the market at a strip that was 75 percent less than the, the competition the husband and wife team shouldn't have to be the one to do that to 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 leverage their entire house and their life savings the um, medical um, community, and not the doctors here, but I'm talking the, uh, the people who make medical devices, they could have done that a long time ago, but it's avarice, it's greed, and that needs to change that there are sometimes the aspects of, of the for-profit nature is not right, especially when it, there's too much being raked on in. Uh, and so that was kind of like stage one. The stage two is how do we take our products globally and lower the cost? Because, you know, one dollar a strip, you know, test three times a day for less than the cost of a latte. Well, how is that affordable in Pakistan? How is that affordable in India? How about in some of these other countries that have rampant obesity problems as they adopt a westernized diet? 
um, this is this is the challenge, you know, because I can tell you this, all of those big chain restaurants have got to the countries before we've got there. And now we're seeing the effects of them uh, ricochet across, across the globe. And so our goal is, you know, we, we take these profits and then we add to that information. If you go to our website, you will see that we do recipes, how to's. Okay, so that was fun. Um, whole sy total system crash. Um, so yeah, so the the whole thing is, I, I lost everything. So I'm kind of trying trying to reconfigure it all now. Um, is Dorian? I'm still here. If you can hear me. So you know, as we as we see the the challenges of telemedicine is to be able to connect on into all of these different systems, um, to be able to give the data set in the pertinent way that the that doctor likes to work uh, or that doctor system likes to work. Um, so uh, we have spent this last year building out a secure HIPAA compliant encrypted health cloud through OAuth authorization um, on multiple servers, both in, in Europe and in the Americas. And um, the goal with this, now that we have this back end built, is for us to connect on into the different systems. Um, but, you know, the system that maybe the EHR system, the electronic health record system that um, uh, Brian uses is going to be different to the university system that Dr. Westman uses. Some might just want to see a PDF snapshot. Some people might want to have live data feeds coming on in. And it's how that they use that data. Like what, for instance, if, if you could say, I want to see everybody today who's got a blood glucose over 140 or 160. We've got, we're not getting those blood glucose down. How can we take what we see in the commercial world of um, contact, contact relation management systems where we can take a whole group of people say, hey, we're concerned today about your blood glucose. We have noticed because you have been tracking your macros and tracking your food logs that we've asked you to do, that there are some of these items on here that have us for concern. Now, if we can do that every single day, maybe have a nurse practitioner review all of those items to get at any of that and send that out, we are changing the person's habits. That's the hardest thing to do. You can, is to change the person's habits. Do you know 28% of people don't take their pills? Well, if you, if you can't get people to take a pill sometimes, how are you expected to change something that's being ingrained with them over generations because their parents did it or their grandparents did it or that you have to get over the social economic challenges or the peer pressure challenges? You know, the mother of the household who's trying to make a difference in her life yet the father of that household is just doing exactly the same thing as he did before or that she is having to cook separately for uh, their children and separately for the for, uh, for everybody else those are the pieces that's the hard part to get with telemedicine and obviously the other hard part is when you can't get the connections to work <laughs> like we saw today uh, and you've got to have that you know when you're trying to do a one-to-one -one with a patient you have the privacy laws that you've got to get around. The amount of work that we've had to do on privacy on our back end to make sure that this will work is immense because even in some of the best systems get hacked. How can you have that privacy when you know you've got to have an encrypted channel and that encryption is updated every three seconds so you can do a true one-to-one? -one? These are the challenges as we move forward that I think we'll face um, uh, for telemedicine. But we've done a massive amount of, of work on our back end with our app. Uh, actually, we just launched it two days ago. It's got My Mojo Health. This is the first time where people can now save their data to the cloud. And then coming in the next few months, we will be have a laundry list of different EHR systems that we are working with. And suddenly, so if you don't want to see your data on my app, maybe you'll see it on Chronometer. Maybe you'll see it on Biocanic. Maybe you'll see it on Change Healthcare or Elation Health. And one by one, we're going to try and connect into everywhere so that if a doctor wants to get that data, they can get it. And more importantly, the patient has access to that data. 
and they can change their outcomes because they can see their blood glucose go up or down, or they can see whether or not they're getting dropped out of ketosis because maybe they do have a problem with sugar alcohols. Uh, those are the important pieces. Uh, I know personally I have a problem with sugar alcohols and I avoid them, but they're also kind of like my methadone. You know, they're sort of like, they're, they're, to me, they could almost be a gateway drug, a drug to the, the chocolate cake or the chocolate bis biscuits and that thing. I'm, I'm, I'm going down that slippery slope. So for me, I like to keep away. Okay, so uh, Heather, Heather hasn't been able to get back on yet, but uh, um, I think what she was wanting to ask Brian was, um, especially since she's such a new practice, like how... how this chat you, is so weird. How, how much are you, um, um, well, how did you get, how, how did you get started with all this remote monitoring stuff and that? I mean, I think she's looking at like, how yeah. do we, how do we do this yeah. in, in our practice? Yeah, Tro is a huge influence on me. We, we, we're running the same system and, and uh, you know, there's some things I value more than he does and some things he likes more than I do. Uh, for me, I don't care as much about the scale. I think it's detrimental a lot of times in the beginning, but long term, he's using it to see if someone gains five pounds, let's make a phone call and see what's happening, even if there's, they're no longer in this program because we don't want to just lose weight and gain it back like has been the problem with everyone. For me, initially, I've been doing this a month and a half in this clinic. The, the most valuable tool has been the 24-hour the glucose monitors. You know, I currently use Freestyle Libre, no financial interest. I have no financial interest in Keto Mojo, but it's been a valuable tool because when someone's sugars are not reacting the way they should, I can look at their ketones and say, oh, okay, now I understand. We, we've had this happen several times where we can see what's happening with that patient. Um, and so I think, and obviously having the finger stick glucose and, and, and you know, getting back to the whole remote monitoring, monitoring, what I'm finding now is most of my patients want to come in, right? Most of my patients come in um, uh, unless they're from Northern California and don't want to drive down because there's value of putting that stethoscope on the chest, of getting laboratories, of getting measurements. So I think there's going to be a hybrid model because look at Verta's doing all remote and they're helping a lot of people. As a matter of fact, one of my patients came in with a, a flyer and it said, reverse your diabetes. And uh, they're, they're going to Verta. And I'm like, yeah, let's work together. This is great because the more people in there, the better off we're going to do. And, and uh, Restore Health is doing some great stuff. So there's a lot of things that we can do remotely and touch those patients. The biggest disaster in my career has been that three month follow up for a diabetic. A lot can happen in three months, especially if you go from October to January and see what happens. Um, we, need, we, we need better contact, we need it, uh, monitoring. And I think a lot of people will say, hey, I knew I was coming to see you. So, uh, you know, I didn't have that extra cookie. You know, I didn't want my weight to be off. I didn't want to disappoint you. So there's definitely a value of face to face and there's value to remote monitoring. Uh, a lot of people are busy and they don't have time and they say, hey, I can do a 10 minute visit. What time? Four o'clock. Cool. Right. Or five o'clock tonight or noon this morning early. No problem I'm here. So, you know, it gives us a lot more flexibility as physicians and also helps with our physician burnout problem and our um, accessibility problems, because really, this is what I've been saying is it comes down to access. The patient needs access Brian, to their physician. Brian, you mentioned yeah. about the, that three month follow up and, and Dr. Westman, you, you mentioned about um, de-prescribing. And, you know, um, I think that de-prescribing through telemedicine could have some advantages. I hear that in Canada, they're, they're looking for a diabetic can walk into any pharmacy, get a finger stick, and then the pharmacist might be able to do a, um, a de-prescribe. And they're looking to, to, to leverage that out there. Um, but what happens if, what, should that person go in and, and go into the pharmacy and then get their medicines adjusted there and then? Sure. Or if you've got that finger stick, you can, and you've got them on that first period, you know, if you can get an AI alert that kind of like, kind of like gives you like, what, here, here is my traffic lights today. This is, I think, is the areas that yet some of these telemedicine platforms have not yet caught up is for you to get that data set in the right way. Or are you seeing in a university setting something different where they're on more on the forefront? I'd love to ask that, that deep describing piece. That was a question for me. <laughs> I'm a bit Brian. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, well, my, my mind was, was going a little, was elsewhere, but um, the deep prescribing can be done at a distance remotely when people understand what the medicine does. So it, uh, it may seem 
crazy, but a lot of the patients that I have that are on insulin don't know what insulin does. So I, I'm, I'm hearing us talking, there's a bit of a digital divide, meaning if we only now go on telemedicine platforms, we miss people who don't have computers. Or uh, And I've done some phone work and everyone is in shock because it's my personal phone and it's not privacy protected. Uh, so um, you know, we're going to lose a whole group of people who can't transform to telemedicine. But you know, I wonder, getting into the moment, right now, if everyone is, most people are shut down, in-house, there has to be some way of free Zoom calls to learn about lifestyle, keto. What, you know, what I see is the Twitter world, all of Twitter, about how you know keto fixes COVID-19. Of course, it doesn't. But it, you know, the more metabolically healthy you are, the better. Is there some way we can like join forces and have a Zoom 24/7 that Doctor Man and uh, I, or Vimeo? I didn't just Zoom, but anyway, this, you know, yeah. As um, a matter of fact, yes. As a matter of fact, that's something we're working on. Tro and I are, are looking at that building a network. You have Rob Zivas, you got Ariel Ortiz. We have all these experts that one of us can man it and say, hey, what you know, what problem are you having? And it's it, you could reach a lot of people very quickly. It's just getting that framework up and running. With my patients, I have something called Spruce Health. I could text them. They could text me. I could call them. I could see their glucose monitors. If I'm really concerned about someone, I could have uh, Libre link up and their sugars go to, a, I have five people, their, their sugars come directly to my phone all day, every time they check it. So one of, as an anecdote, one of my patients, I'm looking at his sugars, I go, that's weird. I was driving to a party and I said, yeah, that's weird, or a, a get together, family get together. And I'm like, hey, sugar's running in the 50s and it's off by 20 points because it's a freestyle Libre, but I'm like, hey, he's running 70 for the, forever and now I'm just seeing it drop. So I called him, I said, do you pull out your monitor? And he said, no, I, I, I don't know what happened. I bumped it yesterday, but I, anyways, I saw him on Tuesday, uh, you know, and I said, hey, was your monitor off? Because now your sugars are normal again. He said, no, I just stopped my Genuvia. He was paying $325 a month for that drug for his copay, and he stopped it. Why? His sugars were running low, and he checked it against the finger stick, and it was actually running low, and he was smart enough to just say, I'll stop the medicine, you know? And then I saw his sugars normalized, but I'm monitoring the entire time. Plus, he knows I'm watching him, so he's like, wow, doc, I can't believe you're calling me on a Sunday to discuss this. So I think that's part of what we can do. We can look at blood pressure spiking. We can look at weight going up, blood pressure spiking, sugar spiking at the same time. You know, I, I had a couple that came in and, you know, they said they had a hard week and I looked at their tracings. They both spiked their sugar at midnight and had hypoglycemia the next morning. I said, don't tell me. You were out drinking and you said, screw it. At midnight, you wanted to go out and have something fun and then you paid the price the next morning. They, they both started laughing. You said, yeah, exactly what happened. You know, we had some drinks for the first time and that's what we did. We went and had some sliders and some pizza at midnight with our friends and said, we'll just live it up tonight. But it was all on the monitor. You know, I've seen people have a couple French fries and it messes up their sugars. And they're like, oh, okay. And they know. They say, okay, I'm allergic to French fries now. I'm not eating that anymore. So they know. They don't need me to tell them. And that's what's really cool about the monitoring is that we can see real time what's happening and not wait three months once they've gone off the rails. You know, that's been the, the nightmare of monitoring. And, and also we can monitor blood pressure. If it starts going too low, we could stop meds right away without even having to have them come in if we're monitoring re remotely. So, you know, it's really cool when people are symptomatic and they start checking their stuff, we can, we can catch it. Yeah. yeah hey, the, Brian. I, I wonder though, hey. if, um, for those who don't have those resources, of course, in my mind, I think Dorian will just send out keto mojos to everybody. But um, I, I would, <laughs> uh, uh, but but there might be practices that. So I mean, we're we're after there was a call just a Zoom of a program in South Africa for folks who don't even they don't have even have a ability to check their blood glucose. I mean, so uh, I, it's um, what I was thinking more was a nonprofit sort of. We uh, a clearinghouse where you could talk to an individual. It doesn't have to be a doctor. I, I get a little worried about the deep prescribing with people I don't know uh, at a distance um, without that patient contact, Brian. I mean, I'm sure you do too. Um, uh, but I, I was yeah, thinking of, of right now is a moment where people can learn about this. Um, I know, uh, you know, Dr. Berg's seminar is going on this weekend. He's got a big thing about the immune system getting fixed by good diet, which is true. Um, 
Uh, so I don't know, I wonder if there might be a, just an information kind of gathering that, and not the full deep prescribing that concerns me a little bit. Um, oh, yeah, legally. absolutely. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I wouldn't do it from that standpoint. Obviously, that would be the doctor's role on, you know, for themselves, obviously. Yeah, that, you know, I'm just talking about educational wise when they're in between business with us. If we could all unite that way and say, hey, Tuesday night, I'll take it. Wednesday night, you take it. I'll do some education. We're basically doing a town hall and keeping people on track, building a community. Um, you know, That's so there's it. no reason that I do a Zoom meeting on Wednesday and Tro doesn't do one on Friday and we could say, hey, patients, go see Tro's, what Tro has to say, because we may have a little different perspective and they may say, hey, I like his his take on it better than you, Brian. I doubt it highly, but it's possible. <laughs> I'd like to answer one of the questions for Dr. Westman um, uh, is, you know, when we talk about getting meters to everybody, you know, I'm 100% I'm behind you on that one. It's how we do it. And I think new standards of IoT, the Internet of Things that uses low bandwidth um, telephone signals. You're seeing this a lot in um, Africa as well. And, you know, for here in America, uh, we've well, got to have your meter and then you've got to have a phone, you've got to connect it to the phone and then you've got to be able like that. And obviously in a society that has a relatively easy access for quite a lot, but not everyone, the lower social income people don't have that. So what if there was a way that we could quite simply do an IoT so you didn't need the phone, or if you did have a phone, you can get a text message back. And now we've kind of like taken out the phone as being the reason of, of display, but really the IoT now brings it back to the main server. So essentially you take the serial number of that phone, which is well known, and then you can then add it into that person. Now we could quite simply, as we know that when you change a person's habits through that first 90 days, perhaps that meter is with that individual for that 90, 120 days. And when you think you've got them right, they don't need it anymore. Because if you test them, they're in ketosis or they've understood what they need to do, you can then um, uh, change and say, okay, we'll take that back. It can be fully sanitized because you know there are meters that can be used for multiple patients, sanitized repackaged up and then go to um, uh, go to another individual. And then if you can get three uses out of that, you've suddenly taken the cost of right now, uh, our product around about 50 bucks, 44, uh, $50, something like that. You've now reduced that down to a much minimal amount um, to deal with. And I think this can be something that can be applied in uh, other nations quite well if we can do it. Um, and, I, and, and that's, I think, a way that telemedicine can leap forward into uh, of using existing technology and get it at a lower cost. And that's our goal, is how do we lower the cost so that we can affect better outcomes? So, you know, I was yeah. uh, on my to-do list. Um, let's see, finish that special issue for current opinions and contact Dorian about getting some keto mojos to my clinic. <laughs> Just give me a buzz. We'll get it done. Yeah. Well, I'll give you, I'll give you Can my I other anecdote. I, I, oh, go ahead. Go oh. ahead. Okay. Let me just tell this oh, real I quick. Just had a, so, I just had oh, a question, ahead. but do your anecdote. Well, you know, Dory, you'll like this. I know you have it on your website and I, my, I have a new staff member and I was on with, with uh, the question and answer for Professor Noakes and they keep knocking on the door. I'm like, this is annoying. So basically what she was doing, she was putting, she was taking the strip out, putting the blood on there, then sticking the machine. She went through 10. I'm like, how much is this going to cost me? Like hundred bucks to get one <laughs> blood draw on this guy. So anyway, okay. Sorry. I had to tell you that. So I'm going to make her watch all make your videos easy. now because your, your website's great. Yes. Thank you. Sorry, Heather, go ahead. No, no problem. So, Question. First of all, Dr. Westman, do you use a lot of remote monitoring? And number two, I'm kind of seeing some controversy into how much we're really using ketones or not, right? My patients, actually it was one of my patients who brought it to me about the GKI. I didn't even know about that. I hadn't seen it on the Keto Mojo website. And my patients seem to really like using that, having data. I do as well. But I'd like to know your thoughts on the measuring ketones, the GKI, and then how you use remote monitoring. Sorry, that's three questions in one. Yeah, so you have to understand that I got into this um, 20 years ago when none of this was available, right? So, and I learned from doctors who had used it for 30 years. So my simple system doesn't require any monitoring or I do no remote Involvement testing, 
and, uh, and I don't have 100% success. So I'm interested in incorporating, you know, up, up the, upping the um, monitoring for those who want to do it. There's no question that it helps with adherence. Uh, I don't even know what a GKI is. I don't know how to do a glucose ketone index because that came from animal data and now it's being applied in humans. And I mean, you, you can have people calculate things and, and they may make some difference or not, but I have no idea if it has anything to do with better health. <laughs> um, but there's no question these things can help adherence in some people, but they also limit the availability of this kind of program for those who can't get access to it. Yeah, that's an excellent point. The Dorian, I don't know if you want to comment on the GKI. I think I asked Gemma, where is the data behind it? My patients love it because they have their glucose, but they might think, oh, I'm in ketosis if they measure 0 0.5, 0 0.6, or 0 0.7, and then we check their sugar and it's 113, then they're out of the GKI range. And just having that little range that says what therapeutic level of GKI is it, it, it's working on um, has been really helpful just in my experience. So I don't know if you have a comment yeah. on that, Dorian. So the glucose ketone index kind of like came out of um, like, like uh, Professor Dr. Westman said from Professor Seafried's work um, uh, on um, the relationship between glucose and ketones, predominantly from animal models, and then now moving in to human models uh, with with GBM, um, with glioblastoma and, and brain cancer. And uh, so it's, it's basically you're taking your glucose measurement in millimoles. So for America, divide from milligrams per deciliter by roughly 18 and um, dividing that by your ketone measurement. So this, this kind of like gives you an index roughly between one and nine. You know, you want to keep it under nine. So it is possible for you to have 0.4.5 ketones, yet because your glucose is elevated, Technically, according to the um, Seafreeds kind of like scale on that, he says you're, you're not in um, therapeutic ketosis. And this is a kind of like a difference between what is nutritional ketosis, which is you know, believed above 0 0.4 or 0 0.5. I, I add 0 0.4 in there. Now, Volk and Finney might say actually it's 0 0.5. But we have also seen that there are some athletes who, and some people that have notoriously low levels of, of ketones and never get into those high levels. So, you know, the, the, the mantra, don't go chasing ketones, chase results, certainly comes on into play. And I'm gonna be the first guy saying like, no, you've got to see the results and you have to look at all the different pieces of data set that can come in, you know, what your macros are like. Um, do you adjust your macros half out? Why do you have a problem with certain things like sugar, alcohols, trigger foods and those things? And is the weight coming off? So is the scales good or is it bad? Um, have you hit a plateau? All of these other things come on. We're just one little data set. But the GKI is getting a greater following. We were the, in our European meter, we were the first one to include the ability to calculate the GKI on the meter. Sadly, the FDA um, don't like that yet. Uh, so that's that's a challenge for us. We're working towards it, um, uh, and hopefully we, that we will get there. More data set, I think, needs to come on out through new studies that are coming along. Uh, so we're pretty happy that through our foundation, uh, the Ketogenic Foundation, we've been able to help support some studies um, uh, through that. It's very nascent and, and a young foundation, but we're trying to build up a war chest over a period of time so that we have an endowment that in perpetuity, we can do um, pilot studies every single year. Uh, and that's our, another challenge for the low carb um, um, universe is who's funding this, the, the studies, the trials and the work that needs to be done. So our goal is if we can get pilot studies done through the foundation, we will then perhaps then other scientists and clinicians and researchers can then go for NIH grants and get more money to come on in. So we have clear evidence-based um, approach uh, to it. Thanks, Dorian. That's helpful. And we had a, uh, one of our, um, uh, let's see, a person in our question and answer section, Peggy, said the GKI for me helps me understand better um, how I'm doing. And that's what I've anecdotally seen. Brian, do you use the GKI a lot just since we're on this? Or do you even use no, ketones that much? I know you I was waiting for Dorian to send me the. 
I was waiting for him to send me the new machine, so I'm still waiting patiently. I guess I don't know, but I have, but I really have. But I'm looking at, it, but I, I do, but I do. You know, really, what I'm doing is I'm just kind of doing it here in my practice, looking at the numbers. Right? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the numbers and kind of calculating yeah. it because, um, you know, it's it's very valuable for people to see. And and I'll tell you, they keep right. me it really helps when they think they're not having progress. You go, wow, mm-hmm. look at you're in. Mm-hmm. That that one lady I was talking about, her ketones were four point one, and she's like, "Oh my gosh, that's why she had no variability with exercise, sleep, you know, that kind of stuff." Anyways, yeah, th- it, it is. Um, you know, here's the deal. This is this is the, the caveat to this technology. The problem is the the low carb keto people have to jump on this, and here's why. Other doctors are not going to understand the numbers, and they're going to see the sugars go up, and they're going to say, "Uh oh, we need more insulin, we need more drugs," and they're going to pile drugs on people because they don't understand the science. And that's where we could be extremely valuable. Um, that's the danger. The, the only big danger I see of this continuous monitoring is in the wrong hands. People are going to say, "Let's throw more drugs on this person and exacerbate the problem." They're going to get more hypoglycemia, more other. Then you don't know what to, it's like blood pressure. We don't know how to remotely monitor blood pressure a lot of times because we don't know if they're stressed. We don't know what's going on. We're just seeing a number. So when we can have constant contact with that patient and, and help educate, we'll be able to do a heck of a lot uh, to help. That's not me this time. So, uh, so uh, uh, I'd be throw as, sure. as an old timer who uh, flies the airplane like a glider without instruments, um, and you know airplanes did fly without instruments. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm very curious, and I can envision a couple studies just right off the bat where you take people who are stuck uh, adherence-wise or, or at a stall for whatever reason, and then you start introducing a ketone monitor to, say, optimize adherence or change the diet so that now there is uh, um, blood ketosis. That's what we're talking about, measuring the, the blood, um, manipulating the diet to have more fat, less, less protein, or, or more intermittent fasting, or some therapeutic intervention and then you're using the monitor to guide that. But you'd have to have a randomized control group with doing nothing. Let, let tincture of time happen because what can happen in a clinical practice is you do this, oh, they like it, we do that. But you might not have had to do anything and they would have just gotten better because time passed. That's why, it, you know, mm-hmm. if you're uh, yeah. to prove that something works, you need a control group and not just say that it works every time that, you know, the, the natives beat the drums and the eclipse went away. And so every time the eclipse happens, they beat the drums and it goes away because they can't not beat the drums and, you know, but it would have happened anyway, right? So it, I think it's exciting and I want to learn more, And uh, but you don't have to do that level of monitoring, uh, but in certain hands, no question it helps. And I can see some yeah, studies. Exactly, I think you- exactly to that point. Exactly to that point. You have to know how to fly when the instrument panel goes out, right? We have to have clinical um, experience, and that's why it's so valuable what you have. Do I line up with everyone? No, not all my patients, but the ones who are in, you know, uh, we're trying to taper their, you get their diabetes under control, get them off meds. We monitor them pretty darn closely at that stage, right? And over time, they won't need it as, as uh, intensively. But at that beginning stage, when we're dropping that insulin level significantly, there are going to be some physiologic changes in blood pressure and, and, and sugar level that we better be ready. Because our biggest concern, the reason people have been afraid of the ketogenic diet and low carb is they're afraid of hypoglycemia. It's like, well, how about if we taper the insulin, then they're not going to get hypoglycemia anymore, right? As long as they're not drinking alcohol, right? Or eating a lot of sugar beforehand and dropping their sugars that way and spiking the insulin. So anyways, I think having it is very uh, helpful, but it, it's not 100% necessary, especially when cost is an issue for patients that we should not have that be a deterrent because we can do it with frequent monitoring and, and have the blood you know, patient come in all the time, check blood pressure. The other thing along those lines, is having the ability to check metabolic rate. Now that tells us what we're doing. Do we have to tweak up the calories? Do we have to tweak down? Do we have to cut the carbs? Can we add a little to this person, you know, based on on their numbers? And and when we're seeing their insulin really low and their triglycerides coming down, can we liberalize carbs at some point, you know, complex carbs, things along along those lines, like what you do, Dr. Westman, that's that's when you say, okay, this has to be a sustainable lifestyle for people. Well, and the use of a metabolic rate instrument in a clinical practice that I've never really seen um, studied uh, or reported on, although I know some doctors use that just anecdotally by going to the Obesity Medicine Association, uh, and now you have these handheld uh, instruments that you can use, but it still takes time, and it's not getting reimbursed. 
which are all factors of whether something gets into clinical use. You know, I was even just thinking of, um, I'm torn because I, I hear stories of people not being able to afford insulin and all this right now, you know, at this moment. And all I want to say is, don't eat the crap, you don't need the insulin. I mean, you know, so, so I, I advise, advise my local mayor, of course, we have a very small town, I said, you don't have to worry about people dying of no food. I mean, the average BMI in Durham is, is about 40. And, and you know, yes, it's hunger and it's terrible, it, it's hard, but you, you're not going to die. So anyway, in a, in a moment where there's a crisis, where you have to balance these things, you don't need a, um, a bill to make people get, be able to afford their insulin, right? You, yeah. You need a, a I just, I, can awareness I, of just not on, eating on that, the things that don't cause it. On that point, Mr. Westman, is that even a type 1 diabetic can reduce their insulin load between 40 to 50%. That's Absolutely. that's massive for, for that community by following a low carb lifestyle that is on that. Uh, we've worked with some type one and type one grit uh, in, in the United Kingdom. And it is amazing the differences that they and, and they get very stable um, uh, uh, glucose measurements. They are able to longer using lo either longer lasting um, uh, insulins or even they actually find that their pancreas is still secreting some insulin to manage this lower level that they never had before. And you know, yeah, if you've got the seventh that. most expensive liquid in the, in the world and you can make a change through your type one population, that's an amazing reduction in healthcare costs for a single payer system or any payer system. The, the possibility yeah, that possibly someone right. was, I'm sorry, I have a, a little lag. The, Dorian, you're right. The, possibility that someone was, quote, kind of misdiagnosed as lifelong inability to secrete insulin. It, I, don't, I bet that's not rare uh, because people just don't think about it anymore. Uh, and then, uh, Brian, I just wanted to go back and, and say um, about the, uh, oh, now I forget. <laughs> it had to do with insulin and, and buying well, medicine. You know, or, well, I'll jump on that. It's, it's not just the cost of the insulin. You look at the, the long-term cost of high insulin levels in these type 1 diabetics. Ty Andrew Berger, hopefully he's listening. He's a type 1. He was on something over 200 units a day. Now he's on four units a day. Lifestyle. Wow. Ben's workout. Ben Bikikio's 15th. That is why I'm a believer. When I see things like this that are unbelievable, uh, you know, people say he'll never come off insulin. He thinks he will. I'm like, time will tell. But being on four units, you right. might as well be off insulin. It, you know, I mean, it, it, it's not going to have any deleterious effects on his health. Uh, you, we're more concerned with his hypoglycemia because he works out at such a high level. So I think it's things like this. When, when it, here's what's going to come down to, and this is what I've been saying since day one in low carb. It's going to come down to money. When the pharmaceutical industry, not the pharmaceutical industry, I'll take that back, the uh, insurance industry and life insurance, when they see the numbers and they see uh, when they weigh out the, the cost this person is going to be to the healthcare system, tapering that insulin is the best thing you can do. Decreased risk of dialysis, cardiovascular disease, everything we all talk about, all, you know, this whole conference. So you look at it and say, is it worth the investment to do upfront education, not only because of the financial cost, but because of the emotional and, and personal suffering for the patient. So until the paradigm changes, we're going to have a disaster on our hands in, in healthcare. Amen. The Thank you. Industry, Can, oh, yeah. Yeah. The insurance industry is looking at it. We met with um, the chief medical officer at Swiss Re when we were in um, Switzerland. Uh, and they've, they've got the data set. They're beginning to, they're beginning to see that and understand. So, Hopefully that, you know, that, that was, they'll start taking a closer look. If they can reduce down their payouts, I feel sure an insurance company is beginning, going to begin to take a good hard look at that. And if they can actually get, you know, um, data-driven outcomes from uh, people being healthy rather than people being sick, that will definitely be the, 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 game, the game changer, I, I think. Um, so I think you hit the nail on the head there um, without a doubt. Well, not only uh, that, to... not only that, it, it's the, the issue of the, the cost of these medications. It's devastating to my, you know, in my old practice, the patients were spending so much for medicines. So if they're paying me a hundred bucks a month to take care of them and I take them off 800 bucks in, in medicines and prolong their life and make them happier and make them healthier, uh, it's a no brainer. That's why direct primary mm -hmm. care works because it's the medication cost is killing the patient.
right? And dialysis mm -hmm. and, you know, who wants to be on dialysis three days a week and have that lifestyle when, in your golden years? It's a disaster. So it's the cost of the system and the cost of the patient. That's what we have to look at. That's what we have to invest up front in doing what we're doing. That's why what Doug is doing is so important. Um, educating more doctors. The more doctors you have educated, the better they're going to be. So it, the Swiss Re is the life insurance. They're seeing, look, it's going to be a return on our investment. But now we have to start looking at the healthcare industry and they have to start saying, oh, it's a return on our dollar at some point. Because if we could taper some of these meds down, uh, it's going to help the system a ton. And maybe they could pay their doctors a little bit more and they won't have a mass exodus to direct primary care. Yeah. And, and if you take a look on, on like a single payer system, if you take globally, look, look, look at Europe, it'll probably be a very small country that might choose to go low carb before um, uh, uh, an insurance company. I think they might be the ones to do it because they can lower their costs. Um, Dr. Heather, you mentioned that you had some questions. Yes, I have some more questions. This is an awesome uh, conversation. Um, I know some viewers had some more questions, so I was going to interject if you don't mind. Um, so Christy Ross, ha I think was talking to you, Brian. How do you have your remote monitoring set up? I'm working with Elation EMR and would love more information. Yeah, I'm with Elation EMR. That's my, my medical records. It's synced, well, it's not synced necessarily, uh, but, but I am synced with the labs like LabCorp. Uh, I use Ulta Lab for, for cash pay, which is unbelievably cheap for our patients. Um, we're doing uh, Spruce for our communication platform, and that allows us to text email so I can get a text from a patient uh, anonymously. Um, um, you know, we can send messages back and forth, things like that. Um, we're also using um, Cardio MD for monitoring our scales, blood pressure cups, um, basically. And, and we can get uh, it's integrated with Apple Health. So I'm hoping that uh, Dorian's going to change that lineup for me. But at this moment, that's what we're doing. And, and it's working out pretty well. But the problem is looking at a bunch of different stuff all the time. For me, my go-to really is looking at LibreView for the continuous glucose monitors and, uh, and, and being able to see where we're at. You know, and again, for at home, a lot of the patients will have their, their keto mojo and look at their ketone levels. I think long-term is probably not necessary, but in the short term, when people are trying to figure out themselves and look at their sugars, because I'll tell you what happens with this remote model, moder, monitoring and the reason why education is so important, because it happened to me when I started, my sugar started going up eating zero carbs, keto, intermittent fasting. I'm like, what the heck is it going to called, called Jason. And I go, Jason, fun, what's happening? My sugars are going up, something's wrong with me. And he goes, you're, you're getting fat adapted, don't worry, everything's good. And when I work out hard my sugars go up so all these things that we're all seeing but the awesome thing is with this monitoring i went for a hike with a lot of my patients and they were all watching their sugars go up while we we're out hiking right and so they see oh when i'm extra then they start thinking wow when i'm exercising i'm burning that sugar off it's not in my fat stores it's not fatty liver my nash is getting better and when they see that then they're they want to exercise more they want to be more active and they feel better so it's a it's so awesome what we can do you know and and, and this uh community where you can educate people so that's basically what we're doing with our remote monitoring thanks brian you, i think you had mentioned that same anecdote about yourself on your low carb md podcast and it literally the next day i had a patient come in with the same thing and uh and then another patient just on their own said dr pickett i checked pre-workout post-workout my gki because she likes measuring both and you know why is it worse you know after workout and it, they just love having that data so that was that was a great one all right so um june cressy is asking what about hipaa security and insurance denial pre-existing not totally sure what she might be asking about maybe with well, remote comment. monitoring can you comment i can comment on on the insurance payments i mean if, if brian's practice is cash pay i'm all insurance pay and at, at the obesity medicine association we teach and we learn that you might have to code to get things to get them paid for in a little creative way for example if you're treating diabetes you code diabetes you don't code lifestyle or, or you, you know, so if you're treating hypertension, you code hypertension. I mean, you're treating it. It's not, I mean, yes, you're changing the, for me, it's changing the food or, or you're giving a pill or, or, or injection for weight loss. But so there are ways to enhance your payment through Medicare, Medicaid and insurance companies. And 
In fact, there's kind of a grid, though, of which insurance company will deny if you just say obesity. And, and you know, the craziness of that is I was at a meeting where someone from an insurance company said, we have no obesity in our clients. And we were like, what, go to the mall, you know. And the, basically we said, well, we look at the, the data that the doctors code, and they don't code obesity, so it's not there. And so we explained, well, we don't code obesity because you don't pay for it. And so there, there's a kind of deny. And then they said, well, your company didn't purchase the rider, rider to include obesity. So there's like this passion and passing of the, the responsibility of who. Uh, but um, you can definitely get, I've been in an insurance pay system, uh, of course, at a university. So there's some wiggle room or, or padding, if you will, at hard times. But for 15 years, I've been able to make a living, uh, and um, we teach that a lot at the Obesity Medicine Association meetings. We have a, yeah, a, a one-page CPT code um, document that can really help doctors um, that details how either looking at the data or reviewing the data, um, uh, and there's some new ones that have just recently come on out. Um, so that can help with that. So you're right, Dr. Westman, the, the creativity needs to be there a little bit to be able to bring it in to the practice uh, in, in that respect. Yeah, but that's a two-edged sword too, especially for the patient, because here, guess what? I have four patients in my practice now that I diagnose with diabetes. I have four patients now who are under 6.5 quickly, right? Their insurance company's never gonna know they had diabetes unless they subpoena my records because, <laughs> right, they went to a cash pay lab. Like, they're in a better situation than if they were my patient a few months ago. Because long term, when they try to get disability insurance, good luck, right? If you have alcohol abuse on your, on your uh, record, good luck. So there's a lot of benefit, and that's the hard part. Us docs are trained to upcode everything. I was trained, I went to training to upcode, right? To upcode, meaning you put in all the diagnoses. They have neuropathy, they have this, they have a blindness, they have blind in one eye. All those things, you get paid more, why? The insurance company gets paid more from the government, the sicker the patient is. And so that was my paradigm that I was struggling with. It was like, gosh, if I'm spending all these hours trying to educate people, if I keep them from getting diabetes, I get paid less. If they get diabetes, I'm going to get paid more. That's the bottom line. We all know that. So then you say there's a problem with this system because the doctors are not, they don't have a vested interest in making their patients healthier. Now I do. Why? Because they're going to live longer and they're not going to see me as much when they're, when they're doing what Dr. Westman's been recommending all these years. You know, now we can, we can keep people healthier and then they're not going to call me and I'm not going to be taking care of that foot ulcer because we can prevent it. Right. So once it happens, it's a disaster. And that's, that's a big thing. We really, I hope insurance people are listening because I'm, I'm telling you, this is where we have to go. It has to go this way. It's going to be upfront costs, but long-term you're going to save a ton of money and suffering for your clients and people are going to come to your insurance policy, whatever that may be. Hey guys, that I, I think maybe a good place to call it a day. This is a fascinating conversation. I should have actually left more time for it. Didn't realize it would, it would get so animated. Um, we went a little bit long um, because of the, the meltdown. Um, so I need to get going to try and set up the next panel. I will do my best to get it going on time. But if uh, the time clock counts down and it doesn't start, be patient. Give me a few more minutes and we'll get it up and running as soon as possible. Okay, thanks to all of you for, for doing this and being a part of it. And, uh, Thank you. Thanks, Doc. Thank you. You're all doing right. an amazing Thank job. You. Yeah. It's going to yeah. be tough. Okay, cheers. <laughs> I'll buy you a drink later. Bye. I need it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs>